golden ring in the Bible about the ending of the age. And one thing that's for certain, it draws closer every day. But I am not concerned about the way it's going to end. I've read the back of the book and we win. Amen. Come on. I've read the back of the book and we win. No more lived in darkness. We'll be living at home with him. See, there ain't no need to worry about it if you're born again. Verse is just for Brother Law. He, he'll like this. Okay, you ready? We all want to be winners in the games of life we play. But friends, since we're all sinners, we've already lost the race. But Jesus' blood can take that sin. He throws it in a deep blue sea. He'll put it into your last place living. Give you the victory. Come on now. I've read the back of the book and we win. No more living in darkness. We'll be living at home with him. See, there ain't no need to worry about it if you're born again. I've read the back of the book and we win. I've read the back of the book and we win. No more living in darkness, we'll be living at home with Him. See, there ain't no need to worry about it if you're born again. I've read the back of the book and we win. I've read the back of the book and we win. No more living in darkness, we'll be living at home with Him. See, there ain't no need to worry about it if you're Listen, this next song, I've been singing it since I was 10 years old, so it's probably 100 years old now. And uh, But it still speaks to my heart. I was shackled by a heavy burden. I was neath a load of guilt and shame.
wonderful happened and now I know my Jesus touched me aren't you glad he changed, changed your life amen listen and he made Take your Bible, if you would, and turn with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. The book of Philippians, chapter 4. Just keep your Bible turned there, if you would. I began pastoring, as I shared with you last night, when I was 24 years of age. God placed me at the Buck Creek, Buck, B-U-C-K, Buck Creek Baptist Church in Red Level, Alabama. I was 23 when I got there, and about this time now, I guess I was 24. And the church decided to build Diana a brand new home, and they did. I mean, uh, a pastorium like we had never lived in. I grew up in the projects in Columbus, Georgia, and Diane grew up in the Mill Village in Bibb City as well. And so we had never lived in a home like this. And they built the brand new home for us. And uh, they let Diane pick out all of the, the, the floor covering, the carpets and the walls. And man, Brother Tom, they put an office in that thing. And, and we had a garage and it was brick all the way around. And it was on two acres sitting right in the middle of a soybean field. And uh, we, we just knew we had done come to town, okay? We were so far out in the country, though, when we saw lights coming, we knew we had company. And uh, so we were living there in, in Red Level, and Tommy Jr. was uh, four at that time, and Stephen was two. And in the middle of the night, we were awakened by two screaming children to the top of their lungs. They were screaming. Now, I know you ladies aren't going to believe this, but it scared me so bad, I jumped up first. And they were sharing a room at that time. Tommy was in a little twin bed, Stephen in the baby bed. And as I ran into the room, I picked up the oldest out of the twin bed, and Diane reached down and picked up Stephen out of the baby bed. And we held him in our arms. And in just a few moments, they stopped sniffling, they stopped crying, they stopped screaming, and they went right back to sleep. So we put them back in their bed. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and Diane and I went back into the bedroom. We got back in bed, and Diane said, well, I wonder why they were crying. And so we began to discuss that, and we said, well, it could have been that one had awakened the other and had a bad dream. It could have been that one had some pain, or it could have been just the pure darkness because it was dark. Or it could have been a noise that they heard outside. We, we don't know why they had awakened screaming and crying, but we did realize that once they were in the arms of a mom and dad who loved them, they had all the security that they needed. The world is looking for security, and the problem is they're looking in all the wrong places. The Apostle Paul, in writing in the book of Philippians, it is a joy epistle. We often think and talk about those who are the saints at Philippi to the believers. And we think about the philosophy for Christian living in chapter 1. For he says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We think about the pattern for Christian living when we look at chapter 2 verse 5 when he says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. We love chapter 3 and we think about the prize for Christian living when Paul says, Forgetting those things which are behind, he said, I press for the mark, for the prize, the goal of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. When we get to chapter 4, we see the power for Christian living and you know verse 13 as well as anybody. Say it with me. I can do all things through Christ whom strengthens me. However, church, there was a problem in this joyful epistle. There was a problem in the local church. There were two women, one by the name of Euodius, the other by the name of Sintichi. I hope nobody in here is named Euodius or Sintichi. If they are, you ought to hate your mom and daddy. <laughs> Because these two women evidently were having a squabble. There was a conflict going on in the very beginning of chapter 4. We don't know if they were arguing over who was going to have the solo and the choir. 
We don't know if they were arguing over who was going to lead vacation Bible school. We don't know if they were arguing over the decorations. We don't know if they were arguing who was going to be the president of the WMU. We don't know why they were arguing, but there was a conflict of some sort. Now you read those first few verses in chapter 4. And so Paul said, in the midst of this joyful epistle, he had to set the record straight with these folks. And he wanted them to understand their security was not in the fact that they had given to his ministry. Their security was not in the fact that they were a happy church. Their security was not in the fact that they lived in the city of Philippi. But he wanted them to understand the only security that they had was in a personal encounter relationship with Jesus Christ. Now tonight what I want to do is I want to walk you through chapter 4, a good bit of it. And I want to talk to you about why I have security in Christ. And Paul, it appears, but a lot was reminding them as he closes the book of all the blessings of their life as believers. What God had given to them. And not to let, matter of fact, he said, I'm going to appoint a yoke fellow, Clement. I'm going to appoint him to kind of straighten this matter out. Not let it get out of control. And then Paul says these words beginning in verse 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation, your conduct, your lifestyle be known to all men. And then he says, the Lord is at hand. Tonight I have security in Jesus because of the presence of Christ. The Bible says the Lord is at hand. Hand. Any preacher worth a grain of salt will preach that Jesus Christ is coming again. The Apostle Paul preached that. You remember 1 Thessalonians? At the end of chapter, every chapter, he talked about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the very end of the book of the Revelation, he says, Lord Jesus, come. Quickly, quickly, Lord Jesus, come. So any preacher worth a grain of salt will preach that Jesus is coming again. However, Pastor, I believe this has a dual meaning and I believe it even has a more intimate, personal meaning. Because I believe when he uses the phrase, the Lord is at hand, he is saying too that the Lord is ever present with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. That's why the Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Joyce, do you realize tonight that there are many reasons for people to have sad countenance? There are many reasons for people who are in very difficult situations to have uh, a, a very sad disposition or a very negative disposition. But just as I started singing a moment ago, you and I have read the back of the book. We know who wins the battle. We ought to be the happiest people on the face of the earth. For the Bible says, in all things rejoice. Does that mean even when I'm going through trials? James says, yes, you still rejoice in the midst of the trials. You do realize now temptations are all of the devil. But trials or tests can be of the Lord. And we can get through those trials because the reason James writes that in chapter 1, in the very first few verses, he says we're going to go through trials, many trials, different types of trials. He said, but the real key to it all is we can still trust God. In the Lord. At the end of the day, you and I ought to always rejoice. When people see you in the community, you ought to be rejoicing. When they see you at your home, you ought to be rejoicing. I'll never forget when my dad was very sick and I was living in South Alabama, as I stated, and I was traveling back and forth to Columbus, Georgia, and trying to see about him. And and, uh, I would literally leave... Uh, on Monday morning, about 5 o'clock in the morning, and I would not get back. I had someone take care of my Wednesday night responsibilities, and I would not come back home until Thursday. I was a student at the Baptist Bible Institute in those days, which is now uh, Baptist College of Florida, and uh, but I had to drop out that semester because I wanted to go back home and see about my dad. And in the midst of doing all of that, it was very pressing on me, and it was a struggle because uh, there were five kids, but there were really just two of us that would stay all night and take care of him. My sister had a difficult time doing that. My two other brothers, uh, it just tore them up. And so my oldest brother and I said, we'll help take care of Dad. And so with my mom's help, we were there. And so I would stay Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and then go home.
home on Thursday morning, then my other brother, Mike, would stay the rest of the week. And I'd come back and we just rotated. And we did that for months and months. One Sunday morning after I had preached, I was standing at the back door greeting folks. I'll never forget the lady, Sybil Brooks, came out. And she said to Diane, How in the world does Brother Tommy keep going and then keep smiling and keep laughing? And Diane said... Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And then she said, my next point, she said, He has a peace of God that surpasseth all understanding. I have security because of the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Nothing like it when you know that Jesus is with you. Secondly, I have security because of the peace of the Lord. If you would pick up in verse number 6. The Bible says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now listen to verse 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In verse 8 he says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are, are, are noble, those things that are just, those things that are pure, those things that are lovely, those things that are of good report. If there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, he said, think or meditate on these things. Look at the next verse. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. Here it is. And the God of peace shall be with you. Somebody said, Preacher, explain the peace of God. It would take a fool to try to explain the peace of God. You can't. The Bible says it surpasses all understanding. I can't explain it, but I'm telling you tonight, I've experienced the peace of God, haven't you? Without knowing without a doubt that the Lord Jesus Christ is present with me, then whatever situation I find myself in, I know His peace. You know what that word really is? His assurance. His confident. Do you remember what uh, Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6? Being confident of this very thing, that he who hath begun a good work in me will carry it out or perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So there is a peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And I have security, not only because of his presence, I got saved, he lives with me for all eternity, but I have security because of his peace. Now you're going to say, now brother Tommy, how can I know the peace of God? How can I have the peace of God? Well, I think in this text, it points out to us several things. Number one, it points out to us our prayer life. Our prayer life. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and what? Supplication. Let your requests be made known unto God. I have found through these 40 years of ministry that those who have a good prayer life are normally people who have a peace of mind and are peaceful in their lives. You want to get close to the Lord? You want to draw near to Jesus? Spend some time alone in prayer. Seek the face of God. You want answers for your life? Ask Him. The Bible says if you ask, He will respond. You knock, He's going to open the door. You've got to realize that in your life, in my life, we do not have the answers for anything, really. Jesus has the answers for everything. And so, if you're going to have peace going through a struggle in your life, then we have to pray. We have to make sure that we're on our knees before God. And the good news is this. For the believer, God always hears us. Now, there are times he says yes. There are times he says no. And to teach me valuable lessons, there are times he says, Son, wait a while. And I can't stand that when he does it. I'm a type 1 OC. I, I, I have a disease. I'm terribly OCD, they say. And OCD people, they just... Today, I, I worked all afternoon by the time after lunch, and, and I wasn't even there, but I had folks on FaceTime showing me what was being done at the new building. I wanted to make sure that the ceramic tile was the right one was put in the restrooms, and, and I, I just I, I was making them. I had two different folks that walked around saying, okay, Brother Tommy, this is it. I talked to our project manager, and I just wanted to make sure. There was a, I, I'm, I'm a little OCD. I can't help it. Uh, I can't rest at my home unless everything's just... That's right. And I think, I think in 1 Thomas chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> and it drives my wife crazy with six grand youngers running in and out of the house. But I have to have peace in my life. 
And I'll never find peace by being OCD. I'll never find peace by being a worry wart. Any of you ever get worried about things and just stress over things that sometimes you can't even control? But God can control all things. And that's why we seek Him. That's why we pray to Him. That's why we ask Him to meet our every need. Listen, when we find ourselves in desperate moments, whether it be in times where we are struggling or if it's times when we're on the mountaintop and experiencing what God is doing in our life spiritually, you still have to pray because the Bible says without that prayer life, we will never know the presence of the Lord Jesus. Listen, pray without ceasing so you can have peace and you can know the peace of God but it's not only in your prayer life it's in some priorities have you noticed what he says there be anxious for nothing but in prayer and so let your request be made known unto God and then he says the peace of God surpasses all understanding he said then guard your hearts the psalmist says guard your hearts it's the wellspring of what? life guard your heart so there's some priorities that you've got to do you got to make sure your priorities in order. Uh, one of the issues that we have in rearing children today in this culture is helping them to understand their priorities. The culture doesn't think that church is a priority. The culture doesn't think reading your Bible is a priority. The culture doesn't think that prayer life is a priority. The culture doesn't think giving your heart to Jesus is a priority. And so those of us who are adults and those who are parents and grandparents and those who are aunts and uncles, we've got to make sure that we teach them that the priority in their life is to put Jesus first. Mine and Diane's favorite verse in our lifetime verse together is Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. You've got to seek Him first. Well, there has to be, if you're going to know peace, there has to be, listen, there has to be prayer, there has to be priorities, but there also has to be a positive mindset. Now, I'm not talking about the positive mindset of Norman Vincent Peale either and the power of positive thinking. I'm not talking about the uh, uh, positive thinking of that old boy out there, Joel Osteen in Texas. I'm not talking about that. But I am talking about a Pauline positive mental attitude. What Jesus taught his folks. And if you'll notice, he says, that what you ought to do is don't think on the negative things. Instead, think on the positive things. Uh, One of my favorite people of all times I was taken to hear was Zig Ziglar. A great motivational speaker. Ziggy was about my height and about 130 pounds, maybe at most. And uh, he was from First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. And he went all over the world teaching and, and talking uh, with the businessmen and preachers and churches and, and doing motivational speeches. And he was a great salesman. And one of the things I remember going to Atlanta one time from Columbus and my oldest brother took me and a couple other preachers up there with him, paid for our way and paid for our rooms. And we went through a conference with Zig Ziglar. And uh, I came out of that conference and I came out of it with a lot of truths, but one that has always kept in my mind is this one. Zig said, do you know what's wrong with uh, our world today? Do you know what's wrong with our businesses? Do you know what's wrong with our family? And then he always threw in, do you know what's wrong with our churches? He said, I'm going to tell you what's wrong, only as Zig could say. And he said, and this is what I came away from that two-day conference with, he said, there's too much stinking thinking going on. Too many pessimists. Too much negative thinking. For we focus on those things that are negative. And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says think on those things that are just. Think on those things that are noble. Think on those things that are true. Think on those things that are righteous. Think on those things that are godly things. He literally says meditate upon those things. Uh, it says as a cow would, would eat the grass and he, he chews on that cut and then he spits it out. And guess what he does? He gets it again. He chews on it again. He gets it again. He chews on it again. And he says, that's what your life and my life ought to be like, the Apostle Paul said. He said, think on these things. Don't wrap your mind with all the negatives of the world. Think about what God has done in your life. And the peace of God will be with you. And you'll have the assurance. And you'll have the hope. And you'll have all the security you need. Now the Apostle Paul said, the Lord is at hand. He's present. 
That's why I can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The Apostle Paul says, I have security because of his peace. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. And I'm not going to get bogged down in all that negativity. And let me make one more statement before I move on to my third thought. Years ago, I made a conscious decision not to allow myself to be bombarded nor surrounded with negative people. And this is what I tell my church folks. Don't you dare come up to me before I preach and say something negative. I will hurt your feelings. I will light you up. I don't care if you're six foot five, I'll still lie. I can take out a kneecap. Now listen, I mean that. Don't you come up with stuff. I mean, I'm prayed up, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to preach. Well, preacher, I need to talk to you about it. Don't you do that to your pastor. That is the most negative thing you could ever do. Don't you do it. And don't catch him after he preached either. You wait. You, you, if you can't take time to come by his office and talk to him or speak to him in another setting, then it's not much of an issue. You've just made it a big one. Now, you know I love you. But I'm telling you the truth. Don't you surround yourself, none of us, with negative, pessimistic people. And so what I've done, I'll just be very honest and frank about it. Uh, my leadership is positive. If they're not with me, and they're not going to be a part of what we're doing, and they're not going to help us to grow and win a church, I, they can come all they want to, and I'll even take their tithe. Amen. Amen. But they're not going to be on the leadership team. That's right. Yeah. They're not going to be on the personnel team, or my finance team, or my... Not, I'm not going to have it. I had an old gal not too long ago... She just decided, I don't know what side of the bed she woke up on, but she came to a meeting and she was just mad. And we hadn't even gotten the meeting started. And so she looked after she got started. She said, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And I looked at her and I said, Honey, you determine what side of the bed you woke up on. Right. She made that choice. And I must be honest with you, she ain't there anymore. And sometimes there are blessed subtractions. Yeah. And I just don't think that we ought to surround ourselves with negative people. When you walk in that door, you want to taste a little bit of heaven. When you, you, you want to hear the music and, and you've got great music and you want to get excited and enthused and you've got a preacher that preaches the Word of God and loves the Lord and when I get to heaven, I'm a, I want one of those voices. Hey, I'm so glad you're here. You know, I got that. When I get to heaven, you know, you know how tall I'm going to be there and I done got it figured out. I done, I done told the Lord when I get to heaven have that glorified body, I'm going to be six foot two, 185 pounds. Amen. <laughs> Brother Locke, you know what I'm talking about? I'm going to be six foot. Listen. Have that deep voice. Have that Adrian Rogers voice. I want, you know. Listen. Listen to me. You ought to come in wanting a piece of heaven. And, and you ought to let, let that old garbage stay out. Yes, sir. Don't let it come in with you. You cannot worship that way. You will not honor God. You will not glorify God. And if there's negativity going on in your life, get on your knees before God. Pray. Think positive. Get your priorities in order. And you know what God will do? God will bless you. And He'll bless your church. And He'll bless your home as well. He'll bless your home. But you ought to always remember that. Don't get surrounded with negativity. Now, here's what you'll say, okay? I know what you're going to say. Well, I'm going to help him, Brother Tommy. He's a little negative, but I'm going to help him. You're not going to help him. Only God can help him. He's going to pull you down. He's going to have you being negative. He's going to have you being uh, dismal. Because negative people, you know what they do? They drag everybody around them down. And you know what else they do? They make everybody around them miserable. Amen. Now you can be nice to them. Try to win them to Jesus. Because most of the time they're lost. Try to win them to Jesus. But don't surround yourself with them. Because negativity will kill you. It will destroy you. And it's never good for the cause of Christ. Now Paul said, I've got security. Because that's my meddling for tonight. Now, second, thirdly, I've got security because of his presence, his peace. That's all in the text. I've also got security because of his power. Will you pick up verse number 10? I love this. How simple of an outline can you get? Brother Darren, you can probably do a whole lot more with this text than we can. Now, here it is, verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly. That now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now notice what he says. Not that I speak in respect 
of want, he says, or need. Not that I speak in regard of want or need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in, therewith to be content. That's the song you were singing last night. It is well with my soul. Look at the next passage. I know what it's like to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed to be full, to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now look at verse 13. I can do all things through Christ, whom or which strengtheneth me. That's the power of the gospel. Now, this verse is probably the most misunderstood verse in the Bible. Because some people think, well, that means that I can just do anything. If God has not given you a talent of singing, please don't think you can sing solos on Sunday morning church. That's not your talent. I, I, I mean, you know, it, it's like me. Um, now I, Brother Ira is a, is a legend in this area in basketball. If you little go and look around, Brother Ira Warnock was a great... He's a legend. He's here in your service. He was a legend. One of the best in this area, ever come out of this area. Um, I played all... Listen, I played till I was 41, 42 years old. But I, I didn't play down low. I, I, I couldn't dunk. Uh, I handle the basketball. I still can. Uh, I can't run up and down the court much anymore. I might could roll up and down the court. But I understood what my role was. I understood I was the one who gave out the assist. And every once in a while, I, I'd get a little hot on a streak or something. And, uh, you know, I, I got a concussion my sophomore year playing. And, and uh, you know, I, so I, I played hard. Uh, I mean, I, I did. But I understood my role. So for me to say, well, I'm going to get down there and bang with the big guys. And I'm going to say, I, that was not where I was. And you're going to say, but time, why are you stretching that point? Because here it is. It's not saying, well, I can just do whatever I want to do. God's going to give it to me. Absolutely, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying in this whole text is, if I'm up on the mountaintop experience, the Lord Jesus Christ and His presence and His peace is there with me, and I have His power. If I'm down in the valley, in the darkest of the days of my life, I still have His presence and I still have His power. And He's going to see me through. I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. And that's what it means. That's what it means. It means you can go through life. Let me explain it to you kind of like this. When you got saved, this is a theology matter, the Holy Spirit of God came to live in your heart. The Bible says, For by one Spirit have we all been baptized into one body. Do you remember what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8? He said, when I go, he said, but you shall receive what? Power. After that, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. Where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world. Do you know what that word power means? I'm not a Greek scholar at all, preacher. No, no. I'm not a Greek scholar at all. But I've been told that that word power is the word dunamis. Now, I like to tell folks... I don't have a firecracker power living inside of me. The word dunamis means I've got a dynamite power inside of me. I have the power of God which saved me unto salvation. I have the power of God that will keep me through sanctification. I have the power of God that will take me to glory one day with glorification. You and I have the greatest source of power living inside of us. Then why in the world don't we act like it? Amen. Yeah. It's greater than nuclear power. It's greater than military power. It's greater than technology power. It's greater than financial power. The power of God who lives and resides in your heart, in my heart. It's for all eternity. That's why we can say, I can do all things. I can make it through the toughest times of my life. I can do it. I can make it in the mountaintop too. I can make it when everything... But I trust God. I can do all things. I trust Him. He's going to see you through. Now if I had time, I'd deal with that other point. 
that talks about not only uh, meeting our needs, but you remember verse 19? Uh, where it says that, But my God shall supply all what? All of my need. According to His, his provisions. His provision. So, so I have security because I know without a doubt He's present with me. I know without a doubt that, that with the Lord He's given me peace. I know without a doubt there's the power of the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of me. Now, let me tell you this. Don't you listen to some old folks who think, well, you can have it one minute and have it lost the next. No, that's not how God works. When He saved you, He gave you all the Holy Spirit you'll ever need. Now, there is a difference between being filled with the Holy Spirit and being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, baptism of the Holy Spirit takes place when you give your heart to Jesus. Do you hear me? There's not a second dispensation or a second act that comes with it. The moment you gave your heart to Jesus, I like to illustrate it this way, from the top of my head to the sole of my feet, that's not very far, pretty wide. However, from the top of my head to the sole of my feet, I have been immersed, baptized with the Holy Spirit of God. That happens at salvation. Now the filling of the Holy Spirit is where Paul says, Be not drunk with wine where it's excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Diane and I did for two years, we did things called what we called a weekend of evangelism encouragement. I would teach the men on a Saturday night. We'd go into a church. It was six ministries in 26 hours. I would teach the men what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then she would teach the ladies on what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And here's the, the real quick thing without you having to go through those sessions. To be filled with the Holy Spirit means this. It means to be controlled. You know what the next word is, don't you? And it means to be empowered. By the Holy Spirit. So you're controlled by the Holy Spirit. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You're controlled. But you're also empowered. I can do all things through Christ whom strengthens me. Well, let me see if I can conclude this message. Uh, Tommy Jr. Uh, just finished coaching at Jackson County High School. A 10-year stint. Uh, finished in the Final Four. Got beat by Blessed Trinity in the semifinals of the state championship. We won, uh, they won one game, we won one game. In the third game, they came out with Tom Glavin's boy. True story. To throw the third game. And so we got beat. Uh, he looked just like Glavin. Y'all know who I'm talking about? Are y'all alive? Okay. Um, but Tommy was so successful in coaching. Now he's full-time in ministry. He's left coaching. Uh, we have two, he has two grand, uh, sons and two grandsons who are pretty decent athletes. And so he wanted to give time there. Plus he'd been doing ministry his whole time. Since that kid was 18 years old, playing college ball and in coaching as a head baseball coach for about a total of 14, 13, 14 years, uh, he always worked two jobs. He taught at school and he also always pastored. He pastored at First Baptist Church, Casita. He pastored in Gillsville and then he served on staff at North Metro with Frank Cox. So he was always doing two ministries or, and he cantered that in coaching as a ministry. But when he was uh, a young boy, God blessed him and put him on some really good teams, especially in baseball. I mean, that joker's got five state championships. And uh, it was amazing. He was a catcher. And uh, one day we were getting ready to go down to St. Pete. That's where it was moved to Warner Robins for the regionals. We just won state. And he was 12 years old, and so Tommy's down there and he's catching up. Uh, the the bull pe- the catcher the pitcher and he's in the bullpen down there catching up Zach and and he's still back so I just walked down there and I said hey how, how's his how's he look what about his fastball he threw a little circle change in his breaking pitch and I said Tommy said he looks pretty good and so Tommy had on the full helmet you know they wear in little league he's twelve and uh, he had thrown his old ball cap off to the side. He threw that ball cap off the side, and so I was just going to be nice. And so I reached down and picked up the ball cap, and I'd never seen this, but inside the bib of the ball cap, he had these words, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, I'm telling you, my chest stuck out. I didn't say a word. I didn't say anything to him. And I thought, man, he gets it. He gets it. And we go to St. Pete, and we get beat. But he still had, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, whether win or lose. Jesus' presence was still there. There was going to be the sun was coming up the next day. 
He still had his peace and he had the power of the Lord. And, and, to, and to look back and now I see him and I think, wow, he, he got it. And I, you know, you always wonder how preacher's kids are going to grow up because they tell you they're the meanest kids in the church. And you know why they're the meanest kids in the church? It's because they play with the deacon's kids. And, uh, and, and so, so, so you always wonder and, and he got it. He got it. He was the oldest. Our youngest son, when he was in middle school, uh, Diane, I thought was going to kill him. All he thought about was girls and ball. That was it. He forgot about education. He forgot about Lord. He He was just concentrating on sports and girls. And I'll never forget one time, Diane threatened to put him in uh, YDC because he had lied about his grades. And I'm not like, you're going to put him in YDC for what? Lied about, you know. But anyway... Stephen was really, really a difficult child because he could look at you. Now, he was Mr. Personality. He'd walk in a room, and Tom knows him well. And then he walks in a room, and he really commands a room pretty well. He's a great young preacher now. But uh, he, he was quite a character coming up. Uh, he was one that nobody messed with him now. I mean, everybody tell you, don't mess with him. And uh, he was sweet and kind and all that, but he was really aggressive and he was a good little athlete. And I'm just so glad at the age of 15, one night after I'd been in a bad, bad meeting at a church setting where I had some folks who were being negative and pessimistic, I got home at 9 o'clock that night. Now, I, I did. I got home about 9 o'clock and I was hungry. I hadn't had anything to eat. And there's nothing better at 9 o'clock than a good uh, egg sandwich. Amen. So on the way home, I'd call Diane and said, Honey, fix me a couple of egg sandwiches. I got in my recliner. You know, I couldn't reach the floor, but when I threw it up, I was up in my recliner. And I got in my recliner, and I was watching ESP, and I was catching up on the latest sports. Don't get mad, ladies. Listen, I tell folks all the time, y'all can have PMS, men can have ESPN. Amen. Yeah. And so we can have ESPN. And so I was... I, <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Sandy. Let me go over here. And anyway, Diane, don't you tell her I said that. But uh, she done got on to me about that. Listen, I'm sorry. Don't get mad, ladies. I'm just kidding. And I was watching ESPN, and Diane came in. She said, Stephen's been wanting to talk to you. And I said, oh, Lord, what has he done now? That little fella come in and sat on the arm of my chair, my recliner, and I hit the mute button. I said, what you need, Stephen? He said, Daddy, I've been running from God. He said, I know God's called me to preach. Man, we never had to worry about another grade. He graduated with honors. We never had to worry about another girl. Man, we, it, everything changed. Everything changed. It made a difference in his life. When he was a senior in high school, he was the only kid at Glenwood High School who started in baseball, both baseball, or all three, baseball, football, and basketball. And he was a captain in all three. And he's five, eight, and a hundred and nothing. And uh, playing very quality sports. And uh, he, as a matter of fact, he broke Tim Hudson's record. You remember the pitcher, Tim Hudson? He broke Tim Hudson's record at Glenwood. Not for pitching, but for stealing bases. Tim had the record of stolen bases, like 40-something, and Stephen broke that record. And uh, Stephen was just a good little athlete. Man, he'd take licks. I, I've been there on the sideline with him and watched him get hit and, and think, God, how's he going to get up? And the old announcer at the school would say, Don't worry, he'll, he'll get up. And sure enough, he'd get up, you know. And I thought he was going to get killed. I begged him not to play football his senior year because I knew he had possibilities of playing. He was a college prospect for basketball and for baseball. And I said, Stephen, don't play for Oh, Daddy, I love it. Man, I love it. And so we played. And uh, we made it again to the semifinals. We were down in South Alabama. Them boys down there know how to play football. And while we were in South Alabama, we got beat. We get back home about 2 o'clock in the morning, maybe 3. And Diane had uh, ridden down with me. And, and so we're coming back. Stephen rode home on the bus with all the guys. And uh, he never did this, but... He said, uh, will you take all my equipment? He, I took his shoulder pads and all, and they had changed clothes, and I threw them in the back of that little uh, Tahoe, and I'm talking about, Ira, it stunk so bad. I'm telling you, I was rolling my window all the way home down, you know, because it, it, it never come off. It just smelled so bad. And so we got home, and I was going to be nice, and I'll be honest with you, I felt a little odd because I knew it was the last time I'd seen my kids play football. 
Uh, I knew that one was playing baseball in college and another one was about to go, but, but I just loved it, and I still do to this day. On Friday nights, I'm on the sidelines. And, and uh, so I just I wanted, you know, I, I said, uh, Diane, go on in and get ready for bed, and I'll get out his equipment and all. So I got his equipment out of the, the Tahoe, and I went into the washroom. And, man, I, I, began, I took everything out of his pants, the knee pads, and his butt, everything out, the pads, and I sprayed it, and I threw them in the washing machine. And then I took those old shoulder pads... I'll never forget this. It was like it was yesterday. And it's been a long time now. It's been probably close to 15 years. And I took uh, that jersey off. I sprayed it. And then he had another jersey on. And we didn't have this kind of stuff when, when I played or when some of you guys played. But uh, I, I call it armor all, but it's under armor. I, my boys laugh at me. I, I pulled it and had an under armor shirt, you know. And I sprayed it. I sprayed it, Brother Darren, and threw it in there. And then all of a sudden I noticed there was another shirt. And I pulled it and it had had tears all in it. It stunk to the high heavens. It was filthy. And I pulled it out and I'm like, what is this? So I walk into the bedroom and I look at Diane and I'm holding it. And I said, what is this? She said, turn it around. And I turned it around. And on his chest it had this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We got beat. (laughs) But he still got it. The victory for us is not whether we win and lose in this life. The victory with us is the fact that the power of the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us. If the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us through the most difficult times of our life, He will see us through. And folks, I didn't mean to keep you this long. You know I can preach short like I did Sunday night. I can preach long like I did last night. I didn't mean to keep you this long. But I've been there. I was pulling up tonight. A young preacher sent me a note. and just said, pray for me. Pray for me. The old church where he's at is beating him up. I've been there. I know what it's like. As an old timer, that's why when I went to Grace and Kevin will tell you and others will tell you that know me, I just told them there ain't going to be no fussing, fighting, and feuding. I'm too old for that and I'm too slow for that. Ain't going to happen. He's hurting. And you know what? Tonight, some of you are hurting. You've lost your joy because you've lost your power. And you've allowed the old devil to step in and not give you, and not not allow the Holy Spirit of God to control you and empower you. And that little run of a son of mine can keep bouncing back and understand spiritually that in his heart and in his life that Jesus is always there. And my friend, you can too. You can too. I've got a man in my church, Gene Pope. Gene is 82 years old. He fishes with Ira. Comes down here and fishes with him to stay in touch. Gene, uh, 17 years ago, had five bypasses. And over these last few weeks, he's waiting on November the 1st. He's going back in at 82 to have open heart surgery again. Now, you know what? He ain't missed church yet. He takes that old nitro. He said, well, if I'm going to die, I might as well die here. I'm like, Gene, don't say that. (laughs) But he walks with the Lord. He's going through a tough, difficult time in his life. I talked to the lady again today that I told you I talked to that wanted to take her life. Today was a better day. And she's not talking about taking her life now. Of course, I made a few phone calls to make sure that others knew as well, you know. But this whole world is hard. But you've got to hear this. My God is good. And He's all the security I ever need. If I never make it back home to 1620 Gratis Heights Lane there in Monroe, my wife and my young'uns, 
The background young men know that their pops loves Jesus more than anything else. And you listen and I am done. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. It's all the security that I need. I want you to stand with me and bow your heads. I'm going to ask Miss Sherry and their pianist to come and begin to play and begin to prepare. Pastor's going to be here at the very front. Tonight, some of you are going through a difficult time. You may be a member of this church, you may not be, but the altar's open for you. I want you to know the security that will see you through. Some of you know Jesus, but you haven't been trusting Him. You've lost your joy. Tonight would be a good night for this altar to be open. If you can't kneel here and pray, these front pews are open here in this Baptist church and you can come and be seated on these front pews. But tonight, church, we call it revival. Then it must begin in me and it must begin in you. And we have to know that the security we have in this life is in Jesus. He's our hope. He's our assurance. He's our solid foundation. Tonight, in just a moment, when we begin to sing, I'm going to ask you to come and just begin to pray to the Lord. You may have to recommit your life and say, Lord, my security is in you. Tonight in this room, you may be standing here right now and you do not know the power of the Holy Spirit of God in your life because you haven't been saved. Now listen, every part of what I share tonight can apply to you if you'll give Jesus your heart. You can know His presence, you can know His peace, you can know His power, but you've got to have a personal relationship with Jesus. And tonight, right where you're standing, it may be a night where you just need to simply say, Lord, I know that I've sinned. I know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin. They buried Him and on the third day He resurrected. And right now, Lord Jesus, I ask You to come live in my heart and my life. And you know what? If you'll do that, the Holy Spirit of God will come live in you. Tonight you can be saved. Now you don't need to leave this room tonight without Jesus. Because without Him you have no security. But with Him you can have all the security you need. Would you trust Jesus tonight? Right where you're standing you might say, Well, Brother Tommy, I'm afraid to come. Why do I have to come publicly? Listen, Jesus went publicly and everyone He called, He called publicly. When he called on Simon Peter and Andrew and James and John and all those others, he said, Come and follow me. Come and see. Come unto me, all you that labor. Jesus called people publicly. Tonight, I want to do what Jesus did. I want to call you publicly, not to me or to the pastor, but to Jesus. And I want to ask you to come tonight and take the pastor by the hand and say, I need Jesus tonight. But the others of you may need to come and pray. And you say, well, I've been to the altar this week. Listen, if you're struggling with your security, if you're struggling with your security, you need to come tonight. Don't you believe the old lies of the devil that Jesus saves and then he leaves you? No, no, no. He never does that. Eternal security for every believer. And he'll see you through whatever struggle. Some of you are struggling. You need to come tonight. Father... Would you bless us now, and as we sing, do a work among us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.